There's a battle raging in our culture, not a military one, but a battle over the definition of marriage. What is the definition of marriage? Should same-sex couples marry? Does the state have the power to redefine marriage? Our culture wrestles with these issues. There are debates over same-sex marriage in politics, in our court system, in academia, at the ballot box, in the media, between family members, and even within Christianity. Several church bodies have already accepted homosexuality, such as the Presbyterian Church USA, the United Church of Christ, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, ELCA, the Reformed Church in America, the Episcopal Church, along with a few others. In 2009, the ELCA and convention ruled that homosexuality is moral, that churches may bless gay unions, and that those involved in same-sex relations can be pastors. This goes against God's clear an infallible word that we just heard from Pastor Agradowitz. Six states, as well as the District of Columbia, have redefined marriage to include same-sex relations through either jurisdiction, court ruling, or by legislative action, such as Connecticut, Iowa, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, New York, and Vermont. On November 6, 2012, Maine, Maryland, and Washington had become the first states to legalize same-sex marriage through popular vote. However, 41 states have defined marriage as between one man and one woman, either by statute or in their constitutions. I will say out of those 41, uh, California is included in that, although their case has gone to the Supreme Court with uh, Proposition 8. And also, I believe Rhode Island uh, uh, does not, in their, they do not accept same-sex marriage, but they will allow it if it's uh, taken place in another state. Now, I will say that this last November, uh, the three states that did vote in same-sex marriage, it's a historical time because it's the first time that the popular vote has, this has ever uh, taken place. All the other, the other six states, it's either by activist judges or by certain uh, court rulings. Moving on, according to many polls, public support in America for same-sex marriage is growing, as Pastor Grotowitz had mentioned. <clears throat> what do the youth in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod believe regarding homosexuality and marriage? A poll is taken at every national LCMS youth gathering. At the 2010 gathering, 60% of the youth who took the poll said that homosexuality is always wrong. This is down from 66% in 2007 and 70% in 2010. That's a drop of 10% in just 10 years. When asked about marriage, 53% said that marriage is for one man and one woman, compared to 57% in 07 and 70% in uh, 2004, which is a drop of, what, 17% in just 10 years. As you can see, the numbers are decreasing. Terry Dittmer said, one thing cited as to why the support for gays and lesbians has increased in the general population is simply that most young adults these days say they have a gay friend and they don't want to be judgmental. Pastor Gradovitz had just mentioned that a little bit earlier. I will say uh, our congregation uh, has not gone to the National L National LCMS Youth Gathering. I think if a poll like this was taken at the Higher Things Conference, the results perhaps might be a little different. But what that does say regarding our synod as a whole, that does, that does um, say something and speaks volumes. <clears throat> On May 9, 2012, Barack Obama became the first president to publicly declare support for same-sex marriage. Most recently, President Obama brought up this issue in his inaugural day address on January 21st, 2013, he made reference to redefining marriage when he said, our journey is not complete until our gay brothers and sisters are treated like anyone else under the law. <clears throat> but two court cases before the Supreme Court might determine the future of marriage. The first case deals with the Defense of Marriage Act, DOMA, which defines marriage as the union of one man and one woman for federal purposes and does not recognize any same-sex marriages. States can choose whether to allow same-sex marriage performed in another state under the, quote, full faith and credit clause of the Constitution. DOMA passed both houses of Congress and was signed by President Clinton in 1996. But a lawsuit was filed in Massachusetts to force the federal government to recognize in all states same-sex marriages that were performed in Massachusetts. Clinton has since changed his view and advocated 
DOMA's repeal. <clears throat> the Obama administration determined that parts of DOMA was unconstitutional and would no longer defend it. I think the House kind of stepped in and said, well, we'll defend it. The other cases about Proposition 8 are called Hollingsworth versus Perry. In November of 08, the voters of California defined marriage as the union of a man and a woman. Yet they left intact civil unions that granted same-sex couples all the legal benefits of marriage. Immediately, opponents to Proposition 8 challenged this in court all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. The question before the court is whether the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment prohibits the state of California from defining marriage as the union of a man and a woman. The U.S. Supreme Court has agreed to hear these two cases, and oral arguments are scheduled for late March of 2013, and the court will announce their decision in June of that year, this year. How will the judges vote? These two cases are the most critical court cases of our generation. They are just as important as the decision of Roe versus Wade in 1973, which actually happened 40 years ago. Uh, and I think the number is 54, 55 million uh, children have died um, since then. I just came from the symposia at Fort Wayne, Indiana, and there was two really good uh, speakers on this topic, uh, uh, David Scare and also Peter Scare. And um, so that was a, a major decision back then in 73. And are we coming up to the perhaps uh, the same kind of major decision this summer regarding marriage? Moving on. We are seeing before our very eyes the breakdown of marriage and thus the family and in turn our own society. The, long, the lifelong union of one man and one woman is under attack. In this paper, we will look at the definition of marriage and its blessing upon children and society. We will also look at how others define marriage and the dangers of redefining marriage. Finally, we will look at the three estates, the family, the church, and the state, and how they all relate to each other. <clears throat> what is marriage? The answer is very simple. Marriage is the lifelong union of a man and a woman which results in children. God created marriage in the Garden of Eden. He made Adam out of the dust of the ground, and he made Eve from Adam's rib or side. I think uh, Pastor Taylor might expound on this. Adam was the leader, and Eve was a helper comparable to him. She was different from him, but she was like him. She was his counterpart. She complimented him. She supplied what he, he lacked, and he supplied what she lacked. Adam and Eve were different. They were male and female. Therefore, marriage is exclusive. It is between one man and one woman. Marriage, in its very essence, is a male-female union. Marriage is not about two males or two females. Marriage involves one man and one woman. God joined Adam and Eve together in marriage. So also today, a husband and wife are brought together in marriage and their marriage is consummated through sexual union. The husband and wife are no longer two, but one flesh. The sexual act unites them in both body and mind. Their bodies fit together for a common goal. In sex, they complement each other. Adam and Eve were different sexually. They were created for each other. Therefore, marriage involves a sexual union of two different parts fitting together. Marriage does not involve the coming together of two males or two females. This is unnatural and self-satisfying. In a homosexual union, actions are done apart from God's created order. Again, marriage involves a man and a woman coming together as one flesh. Through the sexual union of a husband and a wife, children are created. The sexual union of a husband and wife is shaped toward bringing forth children. The sexual act is the only way in which God brings children into the world. God said, God did say, be fruitful and multiply. And Pastor Preuss is, I'm sure, going to expound on that tomorrow. <clears throat> children are not produced at a factory through some non-sexual process. If they were, if, if they were, then this, uh, 
then, this, then there would be no need for male and female or marriage for that matter. Rather, children can only be created through the sexual union of a husband and a wife. Therefore, the definition of marriage includes the procreation of children. Let me kind of back up on this um, factory analogy. Obviously, uh, w many in our culture do not like differences or distinctions. And so they talk about, uh, they, they want to have a kind of a, a genderless society. And if there was such a case where children were uh, produced at a factory, then there would be no need for male and female. And I think uh, many aspire to that because the distinction between male and female they're uncomfortable with and they don't like it. And hopefully maybe there can be some way of, of, of getting children from not some non-sexual way. But again, if this were the case, there would really be no need for marriage. And it will, so I don't want to emphasize that point. <clears throat> Moving on. The purpose of having children is to bring them up within the loving bond of mother and father. They come into this world in a helpless situation. They depend on their mother. They need their mother to care for them. And the mother needs her husband to take care of her and the baby. The child needs both mother and father. The mother is better designed for nurture, and the father is better designed for discipline. Children need to be nurtured and cared for. Ryan McPherson says, quote, the biological facts of conception and birth correspond closely to the myriad ways in which a child remains in need of parental care after birth, physically, emotionally, intellectually, spiritually, no matter how one subdivides and categorizes human nature, it all amounts to a total dependence by the child upon the parents. Marriage is the primary institution for taking care of children. The family is the best and safest place for children. No government can provide what parents provide. Therefore, the state wants to make sure that the child is brought up with a mother and a father. Babies are not born and then put up for sale to the highest bidder. Babies are not manufactured. Rather, God wants a child to be brought up with his or her own biological mother and father. God has established the state, then, to regulate marriage for the sake of children. Let me kind of back up there. <clears throat> you know, you have even uh, many children who, who are adopted, and there is this, connect, this interest in finding out who finding out their biological parent. It, it, it's ingrained in us. We want to know who we came from and who, who is our father and who is, who is our mother. So to think that children are uh, manufactured and then, and then put up for sale to the highest bidders is just utterly ridiculous, you see, because it disconnects. It disconnects child from father and mother, and, and they're treated then simply as a, as a product that is somehow manufactured. Again, I think uh, many who support um, same-sex marriage and gay lesbian lifestyle would perhaps like to see something like that. Now, I really am not really going to get into uh, the modern ethics of, of, of that whole area, area, area either. <clears throat> Moving on. Furthermore, as parents who have faith in Christ, we especially need our children to receive God's mercy and forgiveness in baptism and in the gospel. We need to bring them up in the word of God. We need to teach them about sin and God's grace. We need to teach them to love God and the neighbor. And that takes place especially in the home, uh, but also as well in the church. The union of a husband and a wife is to be lifelong. God said that a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. Jesus even said that what God has joined together, let not man separate. There is a permanence to marriage. A husband and a wife are to remain with each other forever. Their marriage is monogamous. The sixth commandment, you shall not commit adultery, keeps the marriage bed pure and it protects it from a third party. Marriage, therefore, 
is not a temporary relationship. It is for life. The husband and wife enter the marriage relationship knowing that they will stay together for each other and that there will not be another person within the relationship. Their marriage is closed to an outside intruder. Their marriage is not open as if sexuality can be done with someone other than one's spouse. Rather, marriage between a husband and a wife is permanent. It is, it is only between the husband and the wife and no one else. In short, marriage is a bringing together of a man and a woman. They come together sexually, and from this act they beget children. Their marriage is not temporary but permanent. It is for a lifetime. Therefore, there is no such thing as same-sex marriage or gay marriage. The term marriage only includes the lifelong union of a man and a woman, which results in children. Therefore, when this paper uses the term marriage, it refers to the true definition of marriage. Marriage is sacred. It began in creation, and it is a part of creation. It is natural, and it is, and it is a part of our nature. It cannot be redefined or changed. No government, judge, or people can redefine or change marriage. Rather, everyone should respect and honor marriage. After all, marriage is above everything else, as we will see later. Many call this natural marriage, and rightly so. Marriage is natural because it is a part of nature. It is a part of creation. It has God's fingerprints all over it. It always existed and it will always continue. Every culture and society throughout history has regarded the union of a man and a woman as marriage to some degree. Marriage was instituted by God, he created it, but many world religions, even though they reject the one true God, still respect marriage. Every civilization known to man has understood the union of a man and a woman to be marriage. They realize that there is no other way to bring children into the world. So it is regulated and honored. Even in ancient Greece, where homosexual relationships were very favorable, they still honored marriage. They never had so-called same-sex marriage, even in Greece. The opponents of marriage want to call it traditional marriage, as if the union of a man and a woman was a tradition of the past. Marriage today, they say, has changed. It has left the past and has evolved into something better. We can speak of traditional marriage laws within a certain state, but marriage in and of itself is a part of nature. The natural thing for a man and a woman to do is to get married. Marriage is marriage in and of itself. It's kind of like God's name is holy in and of itself. We, don't, we can't make it holy but it's holy in how certainly uh, it's taught and lived out in our lives. But so also, marriage is marriage in and of itself. We cannot change it. It is what it is. The term natural is used alongside marriage today because the true definition of marriage is under attack. To call marriage natural is to say that it is a part of creation. It is a part of our natural order. It is a part of natural law, namely God's moral code written in the heart of all mankind and revealed in the Ten Commandments and throughout the Bible. Let me kind of stop there. Uh, CPH has written this book called Natural Law, A Lutheran Response. There's also a chapter in here by uh, Ryan McPherson about uh, natural law and the family. And uh, it, it would be good if... if um, we could expound, I think, on natural law and the family as well. Romans chapter 2 simply says that God's law is written on the heart. And Aristotle believed in natural law. Rome did. Uh, the early church fathers did. Thomas Aquinas did. Uh, even Luther and Philip Melanchthon followed pr pr primarily Augustine on natural law. But the problem was is when the Renaissance came, uh, they focused a lot on reason. And then they came up with what's called natural rights, that I have a right according to nature. 
And then uh, that led into, well, the American Declaration of Independence that we're all created equal. And then liberalism today takes that uh, natural rights and actually pushes it to mean uh, everyone is, is equal. Uh, and then that is, enters our same-sex marriage debate because they say we have a right according to what we want. One may say, I have a natural inclination toward the same sex, therefore I have a right. So anyways, uh, but natural law is written on the heart to be sure, but God has revealed this natural law in the Ten Commandments and certainly throughout the Bible, but whenever we talk about natural law, it always has to be in check with the Bible, you see. And that's why when some will claim that I have a certain right, uh, it always has to be normed by the scriptures. And I just want to kind of uh, mention, mention that. <clears throat> Moving on. So when many want to redefine marriage, they are going against the natural order of things and against God's word. They are rejecting what God has given from the very beginning. Okay, the redefinition of marriage. How do others want to define marriage? Many want to define marriage simply as a romantic relationship between two or three or more consenting adults. This union of persons might be of the same sex or not, not necessarily. But the essence of marriage for them is reduced to strong feelings toward another person. If the romance is gone, then they move on to another person or two. In this type of relationship, it, would be, it could be a male and, f and a female. They both might have left their spouses and children for the sake of a romantic relationship with a new spouse. This new definition could also be a same-sex relationship involving two or more people. The procreation of children would be impossible because of same-sex union. In this relationship, in this type of relationship, there is no lifetime commitment. Rather, relationships can come and go, or they can be open to anyone else. Again, this definition could include people of the same sex or not. It might include two college roommates who have now graduated and are working full time. It might include two bachelors, two widows, or a brother and a sister living together. These situations may or may not include sexual relations. In the book, What is Marriage? Man and, and Woman, a Defense, the authors call this new definition of marriage the revisionist view because many want to cast a new vision for marriage. They explain the revisionist view in this. Well, let me stop here. Here is the book. It just came off the press about three weeks ago. I highly recommend it. I thought about buying about 10 or 20 and selling them. Uh, to you, but it's written by, well, the footnote is down there in, in, in six, uh, Sarah Girgis, Ryan Anderson, and Robert George. They are all lawyers, and they do come at this uh, from the angle of, of a lawyer, and also, I will say, uh, natural law, uh, but they call the opponents the revisionists, and I, and I like that, I like that title. Now, they call the uh, natural marriage of one man and one woman conjugal. That's their title uh, for, for that. But um, again, if you have a chance to buy the book, it's, a, it's an excellent, excellent book in my opinion. <clears throat> now, here's their quote. It is a vision of marriage as, in essence, a loving emotional bond, one distinguished by its intensity. So... Um, if you've got a brother and sister living together, it's not intense. If you've got two guys living together with sexual, it's more intense. So, I mean, this is vague. How are you going to define this? You know, are you going to be uh, discriminated against the brother or sister who live together and want rights as well? So, um, by its intensity. A bond that need not point beyond the partners in which fidelity is ultimately subject to one's own desires. In marriage so understood, partners seek emotional fulfillment and remain as long as they find it. Notice the language here to define the revisionist view is very subjective, as you, as you, can, as you can see. 
If marriage is reduced to the level of friendship with its degree of intensity, then it would be impossible for the state to regulate it. Imagine a city where the state regulates when you see a person and how often you see this person and what you do with this person. This would be ridiculous. The state should not be involved in regulating friendships no matter how intimate or private they might be. Furthermore, the state should not reduce the definition of marriage to merely a romantic relationship between two or more people. But the state does have an interest in regulating marriage because marriage produces children and children eventually become productive citizens of society. It's a very important point. If there would be no children, there would be no society. The state needs children to be healthy and strong. So since the home is the safest and best place for children to grow up in, the state regulates marriage. The state wants children to be brought up with their own father and mother. The state wants to protect marriage because this is the only institution which produces children for society. The state does not define marriage. Marriage is marriage in and of itself. Rather, the state recognizes marriage and the state supports it, or should support it, <laughs> and honors it for the good of society. Romance is certainly present between a husband and a wife. They are certainly friends with each other, but marriage is different than mere friendship. Marriage offers something more than friendship. In marriage, the husband and wife become one through the sexual union, and this commitment is permanent, not open. It also produces children, and the husband and wife stay with each other for the sake of their children. The authors in What is Marriage, Man and Woman, a Defense, state, quote, Like non-marital friendship, of course, marriage is a type of bond. But marriage is a bond of a special kind. It unites spouses in body as well as mind and heart. And it is especially apt for and enriched by procreation and family life. In light of these, both these facts, it, al it alone objectively calls for commitments of permanence and exclusivity. Spouses vow their whole selves for, for, for their whole lives this comprehensiveness or completeness puts the value of marriage in a class apart from the value of other relationships. These authors go on to say that friendship does not affect the common good in structured ways that warrant legal recognition and regulation. Marriage does. Friendship doesn't need recognition or regulation. Marriage needs regulation. Marriage needs recognition. Marriage should be regulated for the sake of children who will eventually become productive citizens of the state. Therefore, the health of the state depends on the health of the family, as we will see later, or vice versa. Every society in the history of our race has regulated men and women's sexual relationships and has also recognized marriage. The social sciences have proven, and it is also common sense, that children do better under the household of their own biological father and mother. They do better in school. They are physically and emotionally more healthy and they behave well. To make marriages more stable is to give more children the best chance to become upright and productive members of society. Therefore, it is of the best interest of the state to preserve marriage so that children will become a blessing to society. Let me kind of stop there. I think if, uh, if a child lives with both parents to the eight, through the age of 18, they have a 3% chance of, of poverty, which means they have a 97% chance of doing well. I mean, the social science is, 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 is enormous on this. The, the, the benefits of children within uh, w by their own uh, father and mother. And I will also say that six out of ten children uh, through the age of 18 grow up with only one parent. Six out of ten children by the age of 18 
will grow up with only one parent. Um, there's, uh, I meant to, uh, there's several articles out there on uh, the fatherless society and the, the, the sad uh, fact of, of, of fathers and their absence within, within the family for the raising of their children. Okay, I want to move on. And I lost my place. Where did I leave off? What? Okay. So, ch so children not only benefit from marriage, but spouses benefit from marriage as well. A husband and wife are more financially secure together than apart. Furthermore, marriage helps a husband and a wife physically and emotionally. When there is a breakdown of the family, then the state has to step in with one social program after another. The state has to help with single parenting, joint custody, child support, poverty, crime, and the long list of health problems. The breakdown of the family actually grows the government and hurts the economy in the end. It is estimated that divorce alone costs local, state, and federal government $33 billion each year. So for the sake of a healthy marriage, family, and society, the state should recognize marriage support it, and defend it. <clears throat> now, the problem with redefining marriage. The revisionists will say, what's the big deal? Is there anything wrong with same-sex partners getting a legal marriage? Well, it is a big deal, and there are many problems if the state approves same-sex marriage. Let me summarize the consequences of approving same-sex marriage as listed in Chapter 4 in uh, What is Marriage, Man and woman a defense. First, if same-sex marriage is approved, then the true definition of marriage would be weakened. The union of a man and a, of a husband and a wife would be viewed merely as an emotional bond. The thing that a husband and a wife would have in common with same-sex relationships would be simply the emotional bond. The union of a man and a woman in marriage would no longer be seen as the ideal. You see, many want to get away from these distinctions again. We don't want to say, or some in our society don't want to say that a male-female marriage is better than a two-male or two-women marriage. They, 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 many in our society just don't want to say that. So what they do is they want to water down the definition of marriage. Second, if same-sex marriage is approved, then the importance of a lifelong union for the purpose of children would be taken out of the definition of marriage. If gender becomes an option, then other things become an option too. If you can choose between having a male-female relationship or a same-sex relationship, then what is stopping you from choosing between a lifetime commitment or a temporary commitment? You would be free to separate from your partner at any time, after all. Emotions do change. Also, you would, you would not need just two people in a marriage. You can have more. And let me uh, read this um, quote here. Quote, as these norms weaken, so will the emotional and the material security that marriages give spouses. Because children fare best on most indicators of health and well-being when we're reared by their wedded biological parents, the same erosion of marital norms would adversely affect children's health, education, and general formation. The poorest and most vulnerable among us would likely be hit the hardest, and the state would balloon uh, to adjudicate breakup and custody issues, to meet the needs of spouses and children affected by divorce, and to c contain and feebly correct the challenges these children face. So in other words, again, if, um, if fidelity and permanence is, is challenged, then that affects children. Now, in, uh, I was, in some of my reading, um, Sullivan is a famous... Um, uh, supporter of same-sex marriage. I can't remember his first name. Robert Sullivan, I think it is. Anyways, he said that since gay-lesbian relationships um, 
are multiple, not just two people. This will help heterosexual people, heterosexual marriage, because they too can have more than, more than just two people. I mean, you, you see how it just becomes a, an animal world, unfortunately. So, okay, moving on. Third, the redefinition of marriage will hurt children. If there would be no difference between a male-female marriage and a same-sex marriage, then there would be no difference in parenting either. There would be nothing unique about the biological father or mother. The connection between marriage and parenting would be obscured. If a father, for example, would, would be seen as unnecessary, then he might leave the family for something else and adoption agencies will be forced to place an orphan into a same-sex marriage. There have been a lot of studies done on the differences between same-sex and opposite-sex parenting. Many of these studies are insufficient to support strong claims one way or the other. I should say 55 studies that are basically insufficient. However, most recently, Mark Reganeris published his findings in the Social Science Research Journal. He found that Children who were raised by their married biological parents fared better on dozens of indicators than children of parents, at least one of whom had had a gay or lesbian relationship. This study was based on a large, random, and nationally representative sample. It is also true that children who were raised by their married biological parents fared better than single parenting, step parenting, as well as parenting by cohabitating couples. Now, let me stop there. This Reganeris study, by the way, was, was um, heavily criticized by many um, uh, gay and lesbians. They did not like the results of this study because they, they do, do not want any difference in parenting between a, between a husband and wife parenting or same-sex parenting. And so, and so when this came out, they, oh, they just hit the wall, hit the ceiling. And, um, and so it's been highly criticized. But if, if the evidence is preposterous, uh, I should say if, if parenting is far better in, with, with a father and mother than in single parenting, step parenting, or cohabiting parenting, the correlation between same-sex parenting is really no different. Moving on. Finally, the redefinition of marriage would threaten our moral and religious freedom. The redefinition of marriage would say that there is no difference between same-sex and opposite-sex relationships. If we say that there are distinctions between the two views of marriage, then we would, in their mind, be discriminating those who subscribe to same-sex relationships. Would clergy be forced to celebrate same-sex weddings? Would photographers and caterers be forced to compel with the state's new definition of marriage? Would schools be forced to teach same-sex values in school, which it's actually being done in many places now? If we only support the union of one man and one woman in marriage, would we be called a racist and a bigot? My answer would be yes. Would the church be able to freely teach and preach what the Bible says about homosexuality? If marriage was redefined to include same-sex unions, then the definition of marriage as we know it today would change, and the health and well-being of our society would change for the worse as well. Many same-sex civil unions now enjoy all the legal rights of marriage, such as visitation rights, inheritance rights, and tax and health benefits. So why is there a push for same-sex marriage? I believe it is to force the church and our society into accepting the homosexual lifestyle. The three estates. So far, if you have noticed, we have been talking about three different yet related estates, the family, the church, and the state. These are all three institutions that God has established, and they affect each other. Martin Luther mentions these in the small and large catechisms and elsewhere, especially under the fourth commandment and sixth commandment. And I think uh, Pastor Roth probably will uh, mention some of them tomorrow. The family includes father, mother, and children. It began with Adam and Eve. Adam was the head of the home. He provided food for his family, and he protected them. Eve then was the one who nurtured the family. She affirmed her husband's leadership, and she was a helpmate for him. From them came children. 
Adam was their pastor, their teacher, and their father. The family is a place where teaching takes place, especially the teaching of God's Word. It is where the children learn about right and wrong. They also learn about love, sacrifice, and forgiveness. The family is the most important institution. All other estates come out of the family. There is also the church. Adam was the theological leader in his family. He was, he was first given the command to eat from the tree of life and not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of, the, of good and evil. He should have pro protected his wife from the false doctrine of the serpent, but he failed. Adam was to teach his family the word of God. So also today, God has established the church on earth in order to bring salvation to all the world, to create and preserve faith in the gospel, and to dispense the forgiveness of sins. The church is the place where we learn the word of God and we receive the forgiveness of sins. We confess our sins and we receive God's gifts of grace and mercy. Finally, there is the state. God has established the state in order to preserve and protect man's life on earth and society. The state is to defend and to commend those who do what is right and to punish criminals. The state is simply the arm of the law. The state also receives its authority from the family. In other words, the family needs the state to protect it and their children. The state also protects marriage for the sake of children and society, or should protect it. These three estates are all interrelated, and they all work together for the common good of family, church, and society. What harms the family ultimately will ruin the society and civil government and vice versa. Similarly, what strengthens the family ultimately will improve society and civil government. If there is a breakdown of the family, then this has a negative effect on the church and state. If there is a breakdown in the church, theologically speaking, then this has a negative effect let's say, on the, on the moral basis of family and the state. If there's a breakdown of the state, then this has a negative effect on the family and the church because the church then will adopt the postmodern way of the state. Again, there are the, they, they are all important and they are all interrelated, but the family, however, is the highest of them all. When the state thinks that it is the fundamental and most important estate, that it becomes hostile to the family, which I think is happening today. Let's take an example when the state has failed to support the family. Years ago, the state used to determine innocence or guilt in divorce hearings. The state was especially concerned if children were involved. But when the state approved of no-fault divorce, it allowed people to divorce their spouse for any cause. This opened the door for individual freedom at the expense of sacrifice and perseverance within a marriage. It also caused a lot of children to grow up without their father. No-fault divorce has done more damage to family and marriage than anything else. The arguments that were used for no-fault divorce in the 1970s are the same arguments used today to support same-sex marriage. Namely, I have the freedom and the right to do whatever I want. If the state failed to protect marriage by allowing no-fault divorce, will the state also fail to protect marriage today? Is same-sex marriage inevitable in America? How will the Supreme Court rule on same-sex marriage this year? Now, I will stop there. Ryan Anderson, one of the authors in this book, was interviewed on issues, etc. He, he was optimistic that the Supreme Court is going to rule, uh, rule in the right way, according to law. Now, um, uh, Ryan McPherson, McPherson who, who wrote the, the chapter in here, on uh, natural law and family, he's not as optimistic. I'm not as optimistic either. I think just as Roe versus Wade uh, hit us in a shock or surprise, I will also say that whatever comes this summer uh, hopefully may not hit us as a, I don't know what's going to happen anyways. Moving on, conclusion. <clears throat> I firmly believe that we are in a spiritual battle against the forces of evil. Ephesians 6. The devil hates marriage. He wages war against family, children, the church, and against God's word. He will do everything he can to undermine marriage as an institution. What should we do? What can we do? First of all, husbands and fathers need to be leaders in the family, 
in the church, and in society. They need to teach their family the Word of God by means of family devotions and by taking their family to church on Sunday morning. They need to teach their children what is right and wrong. They need to show family, their family an example of sacrifice, love, and forgiveness. But most of all, the best thing a father can do for his children is to love their mother, namely his wife. Second, we need to remain faithful to the church, which rightly teaches and confesses God's word, and we need to be faithful to that word, even if it means persecution. And I think persecution is coming down the pike. It will not be easy living in a pagan society that has rejected God's word and natural law. There will be a time when we must obey God rather than man, and God give us the strength to do that. Third, we need to teach our children and youth about dating and marriage. It is very important for them to marry within the faith or to teach their dating partner the importance of God's word and church. Dating should be taken seriously and not lightly. So that God's word is passed down to generation to generation, our children must remain in the faith and they, and they must reject the false gods of our land. Fourth, as a citizen of the state, stay informed, speak out on important issues, and vote. Just as we defend the unborn, so also we must defend the sanctity of marriage. If we have Lutherans for life, I envision in the future someone somehow leading what's called Lutherans for marriage. I think we need it to educate pastors and churches and society. <clears throat> Moving on. Marriage is a picture of the relationship between God and his people. This is particularly recognized in the union of Christ and the church. Husbands and wives represent the relationship between Christ and the church. Husbands and wives learn to love and respect each other and to sacrifice for the sake of one another and their children. Jesus' first miracle was at the wedding in Cana. He not only blessed the couple with his presence, but he also turned water into wine. He is the real bridegroom, come to redeem the church his bride. Marriage is a joyful and a blessed creation of God. No matter what happens in our society, marriage will always continue. May God bless all husbands and wives with his grace and protection. Thank you.